Step number three, gather up all the estate assets. So you're kind of a detective at this point. Um, what you're doing is you have to determine, well, what did the decedent own? So, you know, you probably know that they own their house and their car and their stuff in the house. Um, but then you got to figure out, well, what are the bank accounts? You have to find out the bank accounts, investment accounts, um, brokerage accounts, life insurance. A lot of times people don't even know that the person who died had life insurance. How do you figure this out? Well, you're the personal representative. So what you do is you go through all of their personal papers um, to make sure that you see like what bills have they been paying? What premiums have they been paying? Um, you know, do they get monthly statements? And in this digital age, when people don't necessarily get um, things in paper anymore, how are you going to figure out what statements they're getting? I mean, do you have online access because um, you know what their, you know, their logins are. So this is what I'm saying that you really do become a bit of a detective um, when you are the personal representative. So the idea is you gather up all these assets. Oh, and another thing is, you know, you might want to check with state agencies if they worked for, you know, the state, do they have a pension? Is there any um, survivor benefit for the pension? Um, Social Security, typically um, the funeral home contacts Social Security to let Social Security know that the person is deceased. Um, Veterans Administration, were they a veteran? Contact them to see what benefits there might be. So at this stage, you are gathering up what the assets are and making what are the necessary contacts, as I've explained. That's step number three. One of the things that I do want to point out um, is that when you do your estate plan, you can make things a lot easier for people. So let's say that you have thought through this yourself. Maybe you've been through a probate. You know how much work it can be and you don't want to put your family through that. You want to make things easy. How can you do that? You can make things easy by just doing a list of your assets and who to contact and passwords. Um, when we do estate planning for our clients, I don't know if you can see this, but I mean, we put everything into an estate planning notebook and in this notebook, there's places for people to put their wills and their asset information, and um, they can do a letter to their personal representative. You know, this is a gift that you can give to your family to make it easy on them. They're already dealing with your death, and that's tough. Try to make it easier so that what they have to do once you're gone isn't a difficult job. So a well thought out estate plan can make things a lot easier for folks. And along the lines of making things easier, um, you know, let's say that you've already done an asset list while you're alive. So your personal representative says, oh, here's an asset list. They just need to take that and then turn it into what we call an inventory. An inventory is something that is part of gathering up the assets that the personal representative does need to do. They don't need to file the inventory with the court, however. We do not file inventories with the court unless there's a darn good reason. That reason is that a beneficiary has requested the inventory um, or a creditor has requested it. Now, if a beneficiary has requested the inventory, that tells me that the personal representative hasn't done a really good job with communicating with the people who are gonna inherit. See, if you as personal representative say to, you know, the other people who are gonna inherit, you know, I'm working on this, you know, this is what it looks like approximately the asset level is. Um, people wanna know what they're gonna inherit. They might have these notions of it's gonna be a whole lot of money. And if you say, you know, uh, mom's estate consisted of the house and she had a bank account of about 200,000. So that's what, you know, the three of us are gonna share or whatever makes it much easier than if people have notions that uh, they're going to inherit a lot more. And if they are kept in the loop about what things are looking like with the asset level, the beneficiaries likely aren't going to request an inventory. So, you know, we prefer that no inventory ever have to be filed with court. 
One of the things you might have heard about probates is that probates are really, really public. Well, they're not really, really public. What I mean by that is when we do a probate, when the law firm does a probate, we file the will with the court and the petition on that first step when we open the probate. And all we say is that assets exceed debts by $10,000. That's it. There's no um, suggestion that the estates were 10,000 or 100,000 or a million. Uh, you don't have to do that. So at least in the state of Washington, um, probates can be quite non-public other than the will is filed with the court. And especially if there's no need to file the inventory. So an inventory is something that does need to be done, done as a part of the process. Now, if you're doing it yourself, um, and you just have you and your siblings, are you going to need to do an inventory? Probably not on a do-it-yourself probate because you don't have to file it with the court. And as long as you're all getting along and there's no creditors, then it doesn't have to be done. Question here is what if assets are jointly owned? So good question. Assets that are jointly owned with survivorship, do they go through the probate process? Probably not unless they were jointly owned with the intent that they should go through the probate process. And I'm not, I don't mean to double talk here. The situation with jointly owned assets is sometimes people put, let's say mom has three kids and she puts one of the kids on the investment account so that it's easier so that when she dies, they don't have to go through probate. Well, that may lead to no probate or it may lead to family litigation because mom maybe didn't intend the one child to get the whole investment account but the child said oh yes she did i'm the only one on this account i own it jointly it doesn't preclude the other two kids for example from saying no 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 that's not what mom wanted she wanted it to go to all of us so family dynamics family litigation happens with or without a probate. It really is a part of, um, you know, was the plan clearly communicated? Is it clearly set forth that this jointly owned asset should go to the one other owner or should not? Um, so litigation is something that you hear of a lot with probates. And that's because what you hear about are the messes that happen. Uh, we try to advise clients that they don't set up their estate plan so that it in a way that would lend itself to litigation. Here's a question for me. When you use an affidavit, a small estate affidavit, remember that's the one when you're under 100,000, um, do you still need to contact the state departments? Yes, you do. You need to let them know you're using a small estate affidavit because they are still gonna review their records to see if they have any claim against the decedent. So the question about co-ownership of property, let's say mom co-owns a house with her sister. So I'm going to go through probate or not? It depends. I know you've heard this a lot from lawyers, this answer. It depends. Depends on how they hold title. If mom and sister own title as joint tenants with right of survivorship, then if mom dies first, sister gets the house. No probate. That's just how the title's set up. What if mom and sister hold title as tenants in common then what happens is mom's half interest in the house goes through her probate so not to sister unless mom's will said i co-own a house with my sister i want her to get it but if mom instead her will says i want my assets to go to my three kids then mom's half interest in the house then goes down to her three kids through the probate and that could result in sister either having to buy out the three kids interest that was mom's before she died or um, some other solution so when you're looking at real property you want to get the last vesting deed and you want to do this as part of the estate planning process before somebody dies so that you can fix things before the person has died and not have a probate that wasn't intended result we see that a lot probate whether it's going to be required in home ownership, again, depends upon the title of the asset. If the house is owned, joint tenants with right of survivorship with the other owner, no probate goes to the other owner. If the house is owned 
tenants in common, the two of mom and sister, then mom's half interest will go through probate to the son, for example. This $100,000 small estate affidavit thing we talked about, that does not apply to real property. It, small estate affidavit is not available if the asset we're talking about is real property, regardless of the value of the real property. If it's under 100,000, doesn't matter. Small estate affidavit does not work. So the best way to find out how things are titled is to get the title of the asset and take a look at it. And if you have questions about, well, what does it really say? You can talk to a title company or reach out to an attorney to help you.